May we have your attention, please? Welcome to Sanders Theater. We ask that you turn off all cell phones and other electronic devices. The use of cameras and recording equipment is prohibited. Please take a moment to identify the nearest exit. In addition to the six regular exits, there are two emergency exits at the back of the mezzanine and balcony levels. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the fifth Harvard Horizon Symposium. Now people say there are three reasons to be a faculty, June, July, and August. <laughs> For me, the three reasons are students, research, and teaching. Harvard Horizon is literally my favorite, pro favorite program because it celebrates all three. It features our amazingly talented students, and you're about to meet eight of them very shortly, as well as their wide-ranging research. It also showcased the great communication skill, which is central to teaching or anything else we do, can be learned and learned well. Now, these are not just my opinions. They are shared by many, many of my colleagues, including our president, Ju Faust. President Faust cannot be here today, but she asked me to read the following letter. I'm sorry that I'm unable to join you to celebrate the accomplishment of this year's Harvard Horizon Scholars. These eight exceptional graduate students have mastered the art of presenting their work. They communicate in ways that are persuasive and powerful. They push the boundaries of what is known, and they embody the spirit of GSS, the purest distillation of scholarship combined with the unfettered pursuit of truth. The future of higher education depends on the unique contributions of individuals and on their ability to share their work in compelling ways. Boundaries between fields are becoming more porous, creating new avenues of inquiry and reshaping the familiar frontiers of knowledge. Communicating about one's work outside one's discipline and embracing opportunities to collaborate are essential skills for scholars and researchers no matter their areas of focus. This symposium, now in its fifth year, is a showcase of remarkable work across disciplines. It represents the world into which our students embark, into which our students embark after graduation, and I'm, and I'm so pleased that it has become an occasion to celebrate the ambitious aspiration of our graduate students and of the GSS. Thank you and enjoy. Well, indeed, enjoy is the right word here that I have really truly enjoyed the past four symposiums. And I had learned a great deal from our scholars, uh, scholar present, scholars presentation. For example, I have learned that if you are in a great rush, let's say you're late for an interview for a dream job, or you're having a heart attack, need to go to the hospital, Trying to avoid ordering the fancy Uber Black or the advanced ambulance, the basic one will do it. Now that may sound very counterintuitive, but uh, you can search uh, through all the YouTube videos. You will find that one presentation provides you statistical evidence why the basic ambulance actually works better, saves your life, has, has a better chance to save life than the advanced ambulance. Counterintuitive but that's sort of deep research, what deep research will, will tell you. Now, the other thing I've learned through these four years is obviously that uh, to launch and sustain a program like this really takes far more than I initially thought when I had the lunch meeting about five years ago with uh, Professor Hisa Kuriyama. When he presented me that idea of Harvard Horizon, I said, great, as a new dean, I was very eager to do anything new, so I said, great, without really knowing how much work it would take. And literally, as people say, it takes a village to raise a child, but this is really takes a lot more than that. Um, over these four years, that it really takes a, a great box center and the leadership of Professor Robert Liu, and with multiple individuals, they're all listed here, uh, particularly uh, Pamela Pollock 
and uh, Marlene Kuzmik, as well as Mara Sidmore, that these are the individuals that have made this program really uh, uh, possible. And there are others who I want to uh, thank later, but I want to uh, thank one individual today. She's actually not here, but she was uh, uh, crucial in starting the faculty involvement in this particular program. That's Professor Laura Fromm from the VES, as the, uh, many of you may remember her. That it was probably unfortunate for her, but it was fortunate for me, that I met her during this uh, new faculty orientation uh, program. Uh, during, uh, she sat next to me for the dinner, and the later when, I, uh, when she his I started this program, we're looking for a faculty leaders to do the to the do this training, and her name comes to me immediately. And uh, as a junior faculty, that you know she has so many other things to do, but she was uh, so willing and, and so ably to, at the very beginning to lead this program. And uh, uh, this year she's on sabbatical, and she wrote to me. She said she very much want to come back, but she also thought that it would be better that if she finished her book so she can be here to enjoy many, many Harvard Horizons. And I certainly support that idea. And uh, particularly, I want to mention her today because today is her birthday. And I told her we're gonna celebrate her birthday. And uh, really, she, she is a case, uh, she's an example of how, how the faculty, no matter how busy they are on their own research, they devote themselves to our students. So I really want to uh, you know, thank, thank her. Now, a program like this not only take human resources, but also take financial resources. And for that, I'm forever in debt to uh, my, my dear friend and a classmate, uh, uh, Professor uh, Steve Blyce. And uh, we were classmates together, and Steve is going to tell you in many ways how he beats me. And, uh, uh, and, and, but to me, what's most important is Professor uh, Steve Blyce himself is a great communicator, and he worked uh, in, both, uh, in both academia, outside academia, and he always emphasized the importance of the communication, and he's also uh, a winner of multiple teaching awards that are given, uh, nominated, and, and voted by our students. So let's welcome uh, Professor Steve Blyce. Thank you, thank you, Shelley, and, and thank you to all of you for, for being here this afternoon for this great occasion. I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you to Harvard Horizons 5, HH5, and to help celebrate and showcase the graduate school and the talent of its PhD students. Um, as Shelley mentioned, we were classmates together. We did our PhDs together in the statistics department many, many years ago, and uh, we actually uh, wrote a paper together back then. And, uh, it's a good reflection of our respective academic trajectories that uh, that paper is my most cited paper, and uh, it is Zhao Li's 29th most cited paper. <laughs> and that number keeps on getting bigger every year. But uh, I have struck back, I have struck back, as Zhao Li was alluding to, and I'm absolutely delighted to say that my recently published book, which is uh, this one here, on quantitative finance, outranks on Amazon Zhao Li's recently published book, <laughs> by 2,583,436 places as of this morning. Thank you. Not that I check very often. Um, so uh, Jali and I have trodden uh, different uh, paths in our careers, but since we've been back together at Harvard as colleagues over the past decade, we've agreed on the importance of, of good communication, and in particular, the importance of graduate students being able to convey complex ideas in a clear, compelling, coherent, convincing, alliterative way. And um, I'm delighted to uh, support uh, the Harvard Horizons program, which really uh, promotes that mission of, of good communication. Um, obviously, communication is important within uh, academia, uh, but it's also equally, or maybe even more important in careers outside the academy. Firms hire our PhD students in a variety of fields, biotech, healthcare, finance, policy, technology, et cetera, et cetera, and they want them to develop groundbreaking ideas. But they also want students who are able to articulate the impact and relevance of their research to their colleagues. And in my own career on Wall Street, I've seen many talented PhD students flounder, sunk really only by their inability to communicate effectively. So this afternoon, you are going to see eight 
talented PhD students with the ability to bring their ideas to a broad audience. Congratulations again to the uh, Harvard Horizon Scholars, They're the cohort of 2017. Um, thank you again for, for coming this afternoon. I hope to see many of you back here again next year for HH6, or as we say in the stat department, HH all cube. Thank you very much. Steve has been teasing me every year how his book outrank mine. So as many of you that I have decided to take a year sabbatical next year, and uh, I'll be working with my wonderful colleague, Professor Joe Blinstein, as well as Nina Zipser here. We're going to write a much more popular book. So in one or two years' time, we will compete. Okay, that's how the competition goes. And uh, now it's my great, great pleasure to really uh, introduce you. Actually, he really needs no introduction, Professor Hisa Kuriyama. As I already mentioned, this whole program is really the brainchild of Hisa, and uh, I told this story before, I'm going to repeat again, you know, he says the one insisted that this program that every scholar should only present five minutes. We negotiate 10 minutes, eight minutes, but in the end, you know, he's a, he's a one. And uh, all the scholars uh, know well that how hard it is to squeeze into five minutes, but it's also probably the most, most important uh, aspect of this program. And I, as I also mentioned that, uh, um, that it, it took really so much work that uh, far more than I initially realized. So this is, uh, I was reflecting this, this morning, I realized why after we had the lunch together five years ago, why I never had a lunch with him again, because I'm afraid of he's giving me another idea which that will take uh, really more resources than the Harvard Endowment would allow us to do. And so uh, with that, I'm going to uh, invite uh, Professor Hisa Kuriyama, who will be moderator of this program. Hisa. So good afternoon. Everybody ready? So it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce to you the scholars, the Harvard Horizon Scholars for 2017. Um, as I introduce each of them, I'd like you all to express with the greatest possible enthusiasm your support for young scholars, your love for beautiful and creative scholarship and, and compelling, convincing, and coherent, yes, coherent scholarship. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to ask each of them to stand up briefly um, as I introduce them. Shay Neufeld, neuroscience. Oh. Robin Gong, Statistics. <laughs> Frederick Reese, Music. <laughs> Crystalline Rhodes, Biological <laughs> Sciences in Public Health. <laughs> John Harpham, Government. Nancy Khalil, Anthropology. <laughs> Xiaowei Wang, Astronomy. <laughs> and Evan Price, American Studies. <laughs> so without further ado, I give you Jay Neufeld. Both ourselves and our world are constantly changing, depending on our mood, our age, our personality. We can often think and want different things. And at the same time, as our environment evolves around us, what it has to offer also changes. So it can be hard to figure out what the right thing to do is. Sometimes we rely on what we've done in the past to make a decision. 
But other times, especially when we suspect something may have changed, either in ourselves or in the world, we decide to try something new. We do this type of decision all the time, from what to order at a restaurant, to how to cut our hair, to who to marry. And when this decision process in our brain goes awry, the result can be profound. We even broadly refer to irrationality as the act of repeatedly doing something with the expectation of a different outcome. So clearly there is value in finding the right balance between relying on our previous experiences and adventuring to find new ones. My question to you is, is there an optimal balance? So that might sound like the stuff of philosophy, but it was actually mathematicians over half a century ago that became obsessed with solving this problem. They referred to it as the trade-off between exploring your world to find new information versus exploiting your current information. In 1952, it was famously formalized as the multi-armed bandit task, where a gambler in front of a row of slot machines must decide which machines to play and in what order to maximize payout over a certain amount of time. The slot machines, of course, have different reward probabilities, and so the gambler must figure out which machine to play to maximize payout, and it changes unexpectedly. <clears throat> so what's the best way to play this game? It turns out the effort to solve this actually resulted in the invention of a new field of artificial intelligence called reinforcement learning. And over the past half a century, statisticians and mathematicians have developed elegant algorithms that optimize how a robot can play this game. But we still don't really know how this decision process occurs in the brain. Are there collections of neurons performing the very same computations that we discovered with math and statistics? Or have our organic circuits evolved to implement an alternate solution? This is what we want to figure out. And I hope to show you today that we've developed a way to figure it out. During my PhD, I developed a multi-armed bandit task that a mouse can play with nose ports instead of slot machines and water rewards instead of money. Here you can see the mouse play by poking its nose into the center port and then deciding to go left or right in an effort to get a water reward. Just like with the slot machines, the two nose ports have different reward probabilities that change unexpectedly over time. So the mouse must constantly switch between exploring the ports to figure out which one will give them more rewards and then exploiting that knowledge once it figures it out. So why bother going through all the trouble to teach a mouse how to play this task? Well, we need a way to record from a large number of neurons with very high resolution at the same time that an animal performs this task. And we can't do that yet in humans, but we're just starting to be able to do it in mice. To accomplish this, we're using some of the same technology that allows the cameras in your smartphones to be so small, but here it's used to construct tiny microscopes, just two grams that a mouse can wear on its head and allows us to image the brain of a mouse while it's behaving. By engineering specific neurons to actually emit light when they're electrically active, we can literally watch hundreds of neurons flicker with activity as this mouse behaves. From this data, we can extract out the electrical information from each neuron and then align it to the behavior of the mouse and start to analyze what kind of information is this circuit encoding about whether an animal switches or stays, explores or exploits. Collecting this data set has been really, really exciting, and by analyzing it, we're poised to uncover our brain's algorithm for deciding whether or not we explore or exploit and compare it to those that we've programmed into our computers. I think we can all intuitively appreciate that this decision process, it changes from person to person, from mood to mood, and across different stages of life. It can also be profoundly different in conditions like autism, OCD, and addiction, where exploring is often avoided at high costs 
and exploiting can spiral into loops of repetitive behaviors that are hard to break. It's my hope that by increasing our understanding of where this decision process occurs in the brain and by what strategy, we might be able to better understand what happens when it malfunctions in these conditions and what we might do to fix it when it does. Thank you very much. We humans cannot know the future before it happens, but that does not stop us from trying. From weather and sports, to our money and health, to the economy and politics. Every day we anticipate how life would unfold because that brings the comfort of certainty. However, when anticipations turn out to be wrong, they can really turn our lives upside down. During the presidential election last November, we together experienced the unexpected. Back then, pollsters and media all forecasted a Clinton win with so much certainty that in retrospect was largely unwarranted. Now, I do not study the election myself, but the election was a humbling experience for me as a statistician whose job is to research models to help establish anticipations. So today, I hope to explain to you why conventional statistical models may have led us to be overly certain when it comes to talking about uncertainty. The way models work in general is that they take in information and produce probabilities to describe the likely cases we are anticipating. However, the thing is, current models are designed only to handle precisely specified input information and will not apply when this information is hazy. What do I mean by that? Well, for a model, precise information is like seeing a point in space. The nice thing about points is that they are all well separated from one another, so that the white point is decisively different from the orange, and so is the green. However, as it turns out, scientific information, be it data or expert judgments, often takes on a hazy form, encompassing many points at the same time. In our terminology, these are called sets. And unlike points, sets have complicated relationships with one another, thus are much harder to deal with mathematically. Currently, all models must choose to circumvent this hazy information by pretending everything is point-valued and well-separated. But in doing so, we're making things up. Not because we believed it, but rather the model forced us to. While often convenient, this can sometimes be dangerous. In my dissertation research, I work to expand the possibility for models to directly handle set-valued input information. I incorporate theories on random sets into classic statistical inference in order for models to have this expanded vocabulary to talk about anticipations. The difference this makes can be astounding. Let me take this example of election forecast. Imagine now that we live in a simple world where there are only two parties, and whichever wins the popular vote wins the election. As we go out and conduct polls, <laughs> there will always be voters whose preference we won't know, either because they did not pick up the phone or they haven't made up their mind. This creates a hazy piece of information in our data, and the current models don't like that. In order to proceed, the model asks us to either throw away this voter or, more sophisticatedly, replace him or her with a random calculated guess to reflect our past experience. Only till then can the model proceed with an estimate together with error bars to reflect the variability due to a small sample size. But think about it. An undecided voter is someone who can really vote for either parties. So in my modeling approach, 
this voter will be encoded as a set with two possible values. And the logical thing to do there is to put this voter into a third category of whose preference we don't know. Now, as we go on and collect data on more and more voters, look what happens. If we proceed with the guessing route, the pile of big data will kick in, and we will obtain a very precise estimate of the vote share, no matter which way we guess. Whereas, if we don't guess, this category of don't know, however small, will linger and refuse to be washed away by the sheer size of data. Now here comes the important question, who will win the election? Again, in the simple world, this comes down to comparing our estimate with the number 50%. Well, in this case, the guessing route will confidently predict a democratic win, which of course would be great if we knew we made all the right guesses and got the vote share precisely right. But how would we know? Had we been guessing differently, this model could have been confidently predicting both kinds of outcomes. One must wonder if any of it deserved the confidence to begin with. On the other hand, the small category of don't know opens our anticipation to a large range of possibilities. The model is essentially saying that with the information at hand, we just can't be sure of the election result. And in hindsight, that would have been a helpful thing to know before the election took place. What I want to say is, model borrow their strength from mathematics because of its unparalleled precision. But precision is not a license to think that just about everything can be foreseen. I develop statistical models that will admit to being unsure when information is hazy. And that itself is a virtue, a reminder for us to stay proactive instead of thinking wishfully and be let down in the end. The future, after all, is not about what we anticipated yesterday, but rather what we create today. Thank you. In February of 1994, on this very stage in Sanders Theatre, six rediscovered Haydn keyboard sonatas were going to be performed in front of a live audience for the first time in over 200 years. But the music you've just been listening to has never been heard in this space before. Harvard canceled the recital because one month before the event, evidence was discovered that the sonatas had been composed not by Haydn in the 1760s, but rather by a 45-year-old music teacher living in Germany. This story is an example of what I call musical forgery. For the purposes of my work, I define musical forgery as the act of attributing your own compositions to somebody else without their knowledge or consent. I came to this topic because, as a musicologist, I'm interested in how and why we value music the way we do, not only in terms of aesthetics and economics, but also in terms of ethics. With this in mind, I want to focus on what I think is one of the most profound questions that forgeries can ask of us. Why is an authentic composition more valuable than a forgery anyway? Now, if you were talking about the value of forgeries in the visual arts, then the answer would almost certainly involve huge sums of money. Paintings, for example, are unique and highly desirable objects for collectors. So of course, authenticity will determine financial value. But music is different. 
unlike paintings, musical compositions do not necessarily correspond to single physical objects created by the author. The scores of the forged Haydn sonatas, for example, were never supposed to have been written down by Haydn himself. The story was that they had been transcribed decades after his death and hundreds of miles from where he lived. I found this to be a common characteristic of musical forgeries. They tend to masquerade as copies of copies of copies. And while this makes them difficult to repudiate, it also means that nobody is making millions of dollars here. So what about aesthetic value? Did the sonatas imitate Haydn's style well enough to pass for the real thing? Consider this passage from the D minor sonata. The chord that I've highlighted is what music theorists call a tritone substituted dominant. Now that sounds really technical, but all you need to know about tritone substitutions is that they are really common in 20th century jazz and rock music, but in the 18th century they were so rare as to be almost non-existent. To show you what I mean, I've recomposed the passage so that it follows the conventional musical grammar, so to speak, of the 18th century. Here's what that sounds like. By contrast, here's what the forgery actually sounds like, this time with the tritone substitution. Now, as an expert, I'm supposed to tell you that that harmonic crunch you just heard in the second version is anachronistic. But if you liked it better, than my grammatically correct recomposition, then you're in good company. For many of the musicologists who initially championed the sonatas, the works rang true precisely because of this kind of precocious originality. We do not expect geniuses to do things by the book. So if musical forgeries are not worth a lot of money, and they're often composed well enough to satisfy even the experts, then what's the harm? After all, music is often thought to be about the sensuous pleasure of listening above all else. Sounding good is what counts. But this school of thought has some alarming implications. Think of the last time you had a strong, personal, emotional reaction to a work of art. How would you feel if you discovered that the author of that artwork was not the person who you had imagined. For many of us, the visceral experience of being moved is underpinned by a sense of trust. Whether we encounter art in a museum, a concert hall, or here in Sanders Theatre, we trust the institutions that place works before us to frame them in historical reality. Beauty, after all, is a powerful thing. When we are truly moved, we want assurance that we have been moved truly. Today, after 23 years, the forged Haydn sonatas have found a place on this stage. The paradox is that we can still find them beautiful, even as they remind us that music's true value is more than sounding Good. Thank you. This is how it all started. I became interested in viral infections when I worked in the pathology lab at Children's Medical Center of Dallas. Exhausted parents would come in bringing their children, usually under the age of three, with chronic 
unrelenting cold infections to have their lung, lung cell biopsied for function. Now these biopsies happened so frequently that I often got to know these families. And they were the same families that came back for the asthma clinic. And I began to wonder, was this a coincidence? Interestingly, epidemiology studies have shown us that of the 25 million people currently living in the US with asthma, more than two thirds of them report having chronic recurring cold infections when they were babies. Did we miss something as scientists? Could chronic colds cause asthma? Now asthma is a disease that we've known about for quite some time now, and we've researched it very much in the past 100 years, and in that time, though we haven't developed a cure or a way to prevent the development of the disease, we have identified more than 100 genes associated with asthma. And the past 20 years have been especially fruitful because we've identified the origin of the disease as those injured epithelial cells that line the lung. Those same cells that the babies at Children's were having biopsied for altered functions during recurring colds. Yet with all that we've discovered and all of the data that we have and all of the information that we've acquired, our best and most often prescribed device is this 50-year-old inhaler that only poorly manages symptoms and does nothing to prevent the progression of the disease. This creates an incredible opportunity for us researchers of asthma. It provides an opportunity for us not only to develop new therapeutic targets, but to design new drugs that could potentially prevent asthmatic exacerbations or asthma altogether. Traditionally, asthma research has focused on altered biochemical signaling. Now, you may not know all of these terms up here, but they're not important. The only thing that you really need to know is they focus on altered ways that cells communicate with each other and how that changes during disease development. The problem with asthma is that it's incredibly heterogeneous and has proven to be far too complex for any of these fields alone to describe. My unique approach as a biophysicist combines not only altered biochemical signaling as the disease progresses, but also cellular level mechanics, or the changes in the physical behavior of cells as they interact with each other and their environment. And when we begin to combine these two approaches, a new physical picture of the disease begins to emerge. But what exactly does that look like? Every day when you breathe, those epithelial cells function together to filter more than 10,000 liters of air filled with harmful pathogens, toxins, and of course, respiratory viruses. When I take movies of those cells, you see that they're mostly static. They remain in their position that they started in. Or to borrow a concept from physics, they're in a jam state. But when I take movies, of the epithelial cells of a person with asthma, they're highly dynamic, they're migrating, they're in an unjam state. Previously, cell migration was thought only to occur during development, wound healing, or cancer metastases. But now we provide evidence that a cell's migratory state can be clearly understood as a physical signature of what asthma and all of its heterogeneity looks like. So using these physical metrics, immobile, non-migratory, or jammed, versus mobile, migratory, or unjammed, we can begin to think about testing our, our hypothesis. So can we push a normal cell to behave like an asthmatic cell using only the cold viruses? Of course the answer is yes, or I wouldn't be here today. But I want to show you some really cool data. So I begin these experiments infecting one time fully developed lung layers, just like yours and mine, and I wasn't at all surprised that much like these control uninfected cells that they didn't move. However, when I infected multiple times throughout development, the cells displayed a remarkable transition from the more stationary cells that we normally see to these more migratory cells that we see associated with asthma. The infected cells displayed similar dynamics to the asthmatic cells. We hypothesize that at the migrating cells are the starting point 
for the airway remodeling. And all that means is the physical changes that your airways undergo to become asthmatic. And what we think happens is the respiratory virus infects epithelial cells. Those cells begin to migrate. And when those cells migrate, they release certain factors that cause a smooth muscle to grow. And that muscle begins to narrow the airway and ultimately ends in asthma. Therefore, controlling the signals of migration alone may be sufficient to blunt the development of the disease. Advances in the cancer metastasis community has already produced drugs targeted directly at controlling signals of cell motion. And when I applied those therapeutics to my system, you can see that I can blunt viral-induced cell migration. Taken together, these data introduce an exciting new pathway for developing first-generation diagnostics and first-ever therapeutics aimed at controlling the development of asthma. Thank you. I study the history of an unthinkable thought. The rejection of slavery is perhaps the most basic tenet of our modern liberal political order. Whatever we think of one another, we seem at least to accept that no one of us ought ever to be a slave. But this was not always so. From classical antiquity, slavery was long considered like the family and the state, one of the common forms that human relations could legitimately take. The aim of my work is to recover the context of ideas in which slavery in America began. I focus on English culture during the early modern period, roughly from 1550 to 1700. During this time, the English trade in African slaves got underway and as it accelerated, helped to establish slave systems in colonies from Jamaica and Barbados to Carolina and Virginia. What most strikes the modern observer of these events is the ease with which the English accepted the rise of slavery. Very few writers bothered to defend it as right from an ethical point of view, and even fewer spoke up to say that it was wrong. And so to be more precise, I study the history of a thought that is, to us, unthinkable. In a setting in which it was so much a matter of course as hardly to require sustained thought. In early modern English texts, ideas of slavery were inherited above all from Rome. The Roman law had started from the premise that by nature, all persons were free. But it had allowed that some persons might be made slaves as a substitute for death when they were convicted of certain crimes or taken captive in war. English authors insisted as, as well upon the natural freedom of all mankind. But like their Roman sources, they believed that there was no fate worse than death. And so they saw it almost as a form of mercy to enslave persons whom one might otherwise have killed. Here was a mental world in which to explain why certain persons were slaves was not to make any statement about what by nature or in essence they were. It was instead to give an account of what they had done or more often of what had been done to them. in part because they understood slavery in this way. Through the early decades of their transatlantic slave trade, the English felt little need to insist that the Africans were inferior. Consider, for example, the maps of Africa, current in England at the time. These were beautifully colored and intricately detailed. They divided the continent into more than a dozen regions. 
inset figures showed the variety of the peoples in complexion, manners, dress, and religion. The centers of African life were the cities, kingdoms, and empires that filled the coasts and spread throughout the interior. By the 19th century, English maps of Africa had changed dramatically. Vast stretches of land were now marked simply unknown parts. But long before the English had learned to represent Africa as the dark continent, they had known it as a part of the world not so dissimilar from their own. And in particular, there was one feature of African life that the English found familiar. The peoples they met in kingdoms along the western coast held slaves, who had, for the most part, been condemned by their rulers as punishment for crimes or taken captive in wars between states. English observers recognized these as the same sources of slavery defined in the Roman legal tradition. What they seemed not to have perceived was that slaves in Africa were drawn in to the societies they served in the manner of servants or tenants in England. And in part because they missed this fact, the English, astonishingly, were able to overlook as well the vast difference between slavery in Africa and the brutal regimes of slave labor that they were just then creating in the New World. The Africans knew full well that their fate was about to change. They were said to fear that the English would eat them on the other side of the Atlantic. And in a sense, they were right. During years of research into this one unthinkable thought, I've come to reflect on unthinkable thoughts in general. As it happens, the past is full of them. And we must assume that from the point of view of the future, so is the present. When scholars years from now look back on us, what will they find to have been our most terrible crime? Will it be that we ate animals for food? That we slowly destroyed the only planet that we have, or that we were so unequal. Precisely the point is that we cannot know the answer to this question. The subjects of my work, they're not alien to me. And that is the worst of it. But as I would myself be understood, so I have tried to understand them. Thank you. Did you know Islam has been in America since the navigators of Columbus's ships? And some argue even earlier? But its institutional presence has surged in the last 15 years, with the number of Islamic centers and seminary initiatives more than doubling since 9-11 to over 2,500 Islamic centers in more than a dozen seminaries around the country today. These centers were previously led by community volunteers who performed the various administrative and pastoral duties that are today increasingly fulfilled by full-time paid imams. Some centers have grown to have several imams on staff. Others continue to have none. In response, I argue, Islamic seminaries are sprouting across the country to meet this perceived demand, 
but more importantly, to establish a local Muslim authority. Except this establishment, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. The Sunni Muslim immigrant community that I work with comprises almost half of American Muslims, and it's not a centralized community. There's no recognized body to authorize who can and cannot be an imam. Unlike priests, for example, imams don't profess allegiance or give vows to a church. When we think of other places where there are imams, you wonder where they are authorized. In Muslim-majority nations, for example, that role often falls under the auspices of the state. Many European nations are moving in this direction as well. However, our conception of church-state separation in the US ostensibly precludes the government from stepping in and taking such a role. Who or what then authorizes an imam, or a seminary for that matter, is what my project is all about. As an anthropologist, I spent three years in the field researching Islamic seminaries and interviewing and following imams. Anthropologists conduct intense field work, spending time with a range of interlocutors. So while my primary interest is American imams, I spent time with others who inform their role, both within and outside the Muslim community. My field sites included seminaries, mosques, accreditation associations, online conversations, interviews and focus groups, events and programs, and more. Accordingly, my dissertation is an ethnography of imams, a group of people, mostly men, highly stigmatized, extremely politicized, serving in a profession that's not regulated or even yet defined. So then, where do imams come from? I've identified three paths. Historically and primarily, imams immigrated from overseas on visas special for religious workers that require them to provide their credentials and their certificates of study that are verified by our US Citizenship and Immigration Services before they receive a stamp of approval that permits them entry to the US to work as an imam. The second, and far lesser in number, are those from here who travel abroad to study, their destinations heavily influenced by our national security initiatives, only to return here to be hired by mosque boards who've expanded the role to be one more commonly found among American religious leadership, shifting the duties from primarily leading ritual prayer to now including responsibilities such as counseling, nonprofit administration, public relations, law enforcement expectations, community organizing, and more. Some journalists have described this as a search for Superman. I call it a search for super imam. How to train a next generation of super imams with an achievable curriculum is the biggest challenge facing Islamic seminaries today. The third path, and most recent, are those here, studying at these emerging institutions. Except these institutions aren't yet really recognizable, and they're still in formation. Perhaps these seminaries will reproduce a Muslim version of the church, authorizing who can and cannot be an imam. The institutions are pursuing their authorization from our higher education boards and accreditation associations. I trace these three paths to show how the government can both manifestly and latently inform who can and can't be an imam in the US through the bureaucratic edifice of visa approvals, through our national security laws, and through the government bureaucracy of higher education boards and of accreditation recognition. Islamic seminaries illustrate to us how a faith group tries to retain an autonomous identity while still necessarily negotiating these government bureaucracies in pursuit of its authority, showing us that 
our conception of the separation of the church and the state shows that they're not as separate as we all want to believe. Ultimately, this leaves imams feeling unanchored, conflicted, and vulnerable. Time will tell if the seminaries will rise to fill this authoritative void, or if the imam may somehow otherwise feel occupationally secure without a profession. Thank you. Imagine this, you are lying in the woods on a clear summer night. You look into the sky, what do you see? The moon, planets, stars, and the Milky Way, a sea of luminous bodies. In between them, there seems to be nothing but empty and darkness. This was once our view of the cosmos. Until 50 years ago, astronomers discovered that the space is not as empty as we previously thought. It's filled by a sea of energetic and vibrant particles. They call these the cosmic backgrounds. And there are three high energy components, gamma ray photons, neutrinos, and cosmic rays. Where do they come from? The origin of the cosmic background is the fundamental puzzle of the universe, and it's the key question behind my dissertation research. From the beginning, astronomers believed that the most likely answer lay in quasars. What is a quasar? In the center of every galaxy is a black hole. Some are dormant, others active. The galaxy becomes a quasar if the black hole is actively pulling in material from its surroundings. Intuitively, we would think that nothing could escape a black hole. That's why we say it's black. But the real picture is, matters do not directly fall into the black hole. They orbit around it and becomes very hot. When this happens, the black hole could outshine billions of stars. Additionally, it also spews out matter. So the black hole is actually a bright engine that fills particles to high energies. This is why astronomers believe that quasars might explain the cosmic backgrounds. Among all quasars, 10% of them eject material through a pair of jets with a velocity close to light. The extraordinary power of these jets immediately caught scientists' attention. They were considered to be the most promising candidates to explain the cosmic background problem. However, after extensive tests and modeling, astronomers found that they could only account for half of the observed gamma rays and do not explain the neutrinos and cosmic rays. So the missing components still remain a mystery. I looked at billions of quasars and discovered a solution that focuses not on these powerful jets, rather on the weaker but ubiquitous features of quasars, known as the outflows. To understand this phenomenon, I'd like you to think about this. Imagine yourself at a piano concerto. What would you notice first? The answer is pretty obvious, the piano and the pianist, right? However, the whole music piece wouldn't be complete without the orchestra in the back. Although we may not pay attention to a single string or brass musician and the melody they play, together the volume from the entire orchestra is strong enough to be in harmony with the piano. Now, back to the cosmic case. 
These powerful jets are just like the grand piano. They generate half of the gamma rays. The concerto is complemented by the orchestra, a collection of less prominent instruments, the outflows in this case, which are moving at a much lower speed than the jets and therefore less energetic on an individual level. The emission from a single outflow is too weak to be detected. However, adding the emission from billions outflows together, I found that the cumulative signal perfectly matches the missing half of the gamma rays and completes the picture by simultaneously explaining the neutrinos and cosmic rays. I discover that these quasar outflows are the solution to the cosmic background problem. Why haven't we realized this before? That's because we were so concentrated on the more powerful and prominent jets that we overlooked the weaker but more pervasive outflows. Sometimes the answer to the biggest questions of science lies in the small and subtle things. These less visible entities are often neglected, but in the aggregate, they can be brighter, they can be more powerful. So the next time when you gaze into the seemingly empty and quiet sky, I hope you can imagine all those energetic particles overflowing in the cosmos. I hope you can find yourself immersed in the piano concerto of the universe. Thank you. Let's talk about the future. Just how much future is there? And how much do we really care about anyway? In the field of time studies or chronocriticism, I research how people understand time. To do this, I look at art and monuments ranging from the 20th century to well beyond the 30th century. Let me show you what I mean. Behind me, is footage from the future past, the 1939 New York World's Fair. It's the dawn of a new day. The World's Fair was a wash in the wonders of technology, symbolized by what you see behind me, the Trilon and the Perisphere, which promised to propel all peoples into a future of ecstatic, technophilic freedom. At the fair, you, can ride, you could ride upon General Motors' Futurama, a 36,000 square foot Aladdin-like ride out of the Great Depression and 20 years into the future to see this world of tomorrow. By 1940, however, this utopian dream of the World's Fair was already being deconstructed for the dystopian reality of World War II. The Futurama, the world of tomorrow, are what I define as a new category of monument, the future monument. Unlike regular monuments, which ask audiences to remember the past, future monuments are built explicitly to manifest an imagination of the future. They ask us to remember the future. One of the things I found in my research is people aren't very good at predicting the future, which is what makes it so very interesting to see what happens when they try. When the future doesn't come to pass, as expected, as it didn't for the 1939 World's Fair, future monuments become tombstones to alternative histories, to parallel worlds which were imagined but never quite realized. This is one of the more useful qualities of future monuments, is they shed light on this gap between ideological imaginations and material realities. Not all future monuments are as euphoric or optimistic as the 1939 World's Fair. 
during the Cold War, that technophilic worldview had darkened with the very real threat of self-inflicted nuclear annihilation. The future, or the lack of it, was horrifying. And when the future puts pressure on the present, people tend to produce future monuments, which is exactly what NASA did when they strapped a golden record, a literal LP made of gold, to the side of the Voyager spacecraft. On the record, images from Earth, greetings in hundreds of languages, and music. Bach, Navajo night chants, humpback whale songs, the late Chuck Berry, and what I'm playing for you now, Blind Willie Johnson's Dark Was the Night. Because there's very little in the vacuum of space to damage the golden record, because it is free from the erosive forces of wind, water, and human beings, it promises to be the most lasting monument ever made. Some estimate that the golden record will be recognizable as such for millions, if not billions of years. By temporal comparison, the pyramids of Egypt look like melting mounds of butter in the desert. Even if we were to obliterate all vestiges of life on Earth, the golden record would still preserve some slice of us into cosmic perpetuity. For me, the golden record is a remarkable thought experiment made actual by the fact of its material existence. It elevates the idea of thinking universally, quite literally, to the universe itself and it inspires some interesting questions. Just what sort of image should we collectively present to the cosmos? Is it optimistic, hopeful even, to imagine that someone or something, somewhere in some far off time might retrieve this golden gift? Or is it pessimistic, nihilistic even, a kind of cosmic tombstone to our species, an acknowledgement of our galactic loneliness. Just how does it make you feel to know that the most lasting traces of human beings in the universe will ultimately be our space trash? The future still pressures the present, and so people are still producing future monuments. A group that calls itself the Long Now Foundation is currently working on their flagship future monument, the clock of the long now. This is a colossal clock secreted away in a mountain cave meant to measure time on the glacial scale of 10,000 years. The clock ticks to attest to the persistence of human beings, talks to impel mindfulness of the future, and cuckoos to celebrate the survival of us for yet another millennium. The question is then, what does it mean when the clock stops? Future monuments are just one avenue into the world of time theory. They refuse to leave unreckoned the contradiction between anticipation and realization. They show us what our grandparents thought the future could be capable of. They compel us to imagine how our children will envision the horizons of their own future. And they remind us that the future is not what it used to be. Thank you all for your time. Wow, I'm really speechless. So I would simply invite you all to give these eight scholars a round of applause that have worked for the past 10 weeks for. Please stand up.
Simply put, you are the future monument of Harvard. <laughs> it is now given me the great pleasure to introduce my boss, Dean Mike Smith. As you all know, complimenting one's boss is always a wise thing to do, <laughs> especially when it is evidence-based. This Harvard Pro Horizon program has received the support from Dean Smith from the very beginning. Not only the moral support, but he was the one actually recommended to the, to the first uh, class of the Harvard Horizon scholars, his own speech coach. Now I challenge anyone to find another university where the dean is willing to share his or her own speech coach with the student. I was also sought to compliment Dean Smith about the presentation skills he has improved over the past five years, but then I realized that would be overdoing complimenting, so I would not do that. I would simply invite Dean Smith to showcase to you his ability to present everything in five minutes. <laughs> Let's welcome Dean Smith. like starting your part of the segment with some challenges there. So first of all, uh, a great pleasure to be here tonight or this afternoon, whatever it is now. Um, and my special thanks to Dean Mong and Professors Kuriyama and Blythe for your incredible support and leadership of this incredibly influential and important program. I thank you on behalf of the entire community. And of course, my deepest thanks to the Harvard and Horizon scholars that we had here today on behalf of the entire community. Your work was fantastic, outstanding, amazing. Uh, I enjoyed it tremendously and I'm sure I speak for the entire audience here in uh, what a fantastic job you did. Your work here goes truly to the heart of our mission, uh, the core of the creation and dissemination of knowledge. I often think that we sometimes put too much emphasis on the first half of that, the creation of new knowledge, and not enough emphasis on the second half, and that's the dissemination, which you demonstrated so ably here today. You've just shown how exciting the dissemination can be, how thought-provoking it can be, upending some of our long-held views. So of course, while I was sitting there, I had to say, well, what is this making me think about? And back to, as much as it is a great pleasure for me to be here to thank you on behalf of the community, why me? As Shay said, are the individuals who run this stuck in a loop? Do they need to do a little bit more explore and a little less exploit. I certainly know, as Zhao Wei said, there are certainly individuals here a lot less visible than myself who had huge influence on the program and the performances of our scholars today. And I want to publicly thank all of them for their hard work, even though we haven't by name stated how much you've done for our scholars and our program. And I'll just leave you with one thing that Frederick said, which is geniuses don't do things by the book. So I look forward to seeing what we do with our program next year. Thank you all. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, Dean Smith, and I will, I will say that to accept your challenge is very easy for me because next year this program will be hosted by Dean Emma Dench, <laughs> who is in the audience, who is a great communicator herself, so you, I'm trying to raise your expectation. Um, since this year is the fifth anniversary of this uh, program, we actually have a little surprise for the audience. We actually have 20 previous Harvard Horizon scholars in the audience. 
Please stand. I want to report that this morning I had a great, great pleasure to listen to 20 presentations by them. We had uh, a really long, long morning, and I also learned from them that uh, uh, they have just so much to talk about. But one of them actually present statistical evidence why people only had their attention span is only five minutes. To be precise, it was 5.5 five minutes, five seconds. So, uh, this is the part that I should have negotiated with Hisa for the actual five seconds, but I didn't. Um, among them, the, I'm going to invite one of them, uh, Stephanie Dick, to come here to uh, representing the entire alumni to uh, give you some remark. Now, Stephanie uh, was the, uh, from the first cohort, then she went on to become a Harvard Fellow, a junior fellow, and uh, after she finished here, she will be uh, a faculty at Penn. So let's welcome Stephen Dick. I really love this day. Um, I think I've been at every Harvard Horizons besides one because I had the pleasure of staying in Cambridge after I was finished graduate school and I always finish this event feeling really heartened and really excited about the kind of work that people are doing. Uh, and today was particularly wonderful because as Dean Shali has told you, uh, many of us were brought back alumni from past years to reconnect with one another and also to give uh, five minute talks <laughs> this morning, catching people up on where our research and our projects have gone since we were last on the stage. And I'm really excited to report now with ample empirical evidence uh, that the values and the commitments of this program live on well beyond this stage. Every one of those five minute talks was done without notes and was perfectly comprehensible to people uh, like me by all rights who should have no access to the kinds of work that neuroscientists or political scientists are doing. Uh, and given just how many chasms there are out in the world we inhabit between departments and between disciplines and between communities and between paradigms of knowledge making within the academy and outside of it, uh, I was feeling particularly heartened to see the ongoing commitment that the Harvard Horizon scholars have to making themselves understood uh, to people who do not inhabit their disciplinary training or their assumptions or their academic spaces. Um, and I was particularly excited because it also brought something home to me that hadn't really occurred to me before, which is that Harvard Horizons, is our talks are kind of a snapshot of a much longer and ongoing story about knowledge making. And while on the one hand these talks represent the culmination of the work we've done as graduate students, they are also pivot points or launching points for all kinds of new directions that the scholars have taken. And I think there, it's really commendable for this program to give value and to give voice to some of the earlier stages in an academic career, uh, which can be really terrifying. New knowledge is always a risk. Uh, and it was so exciting to see the confidence and the value that we all took from this program and adapted in nonprofit organizations and startups and academic departments and classrooms uh, after leaving this stage. So it's been a really wonderful day and it was so awesome that so many of us were able to come back for it. Uh, we are so profoundly grateful to the people who make this program happen, to our fearless leaders, Dean Shali Mung and Hisa Koryama and Dean Smith, who have just a tireless commitment to graduate students, to graduate work, and to this program. Uh, we are so grateful to people like Leslie Kress and Molly Lockwood who make these days run so smoothly and help us out at every turn even though we're late with everything they ask us for <laughs> all the time. And of course we are beyond grateful to Pamela Pollock and Marlon Kuzmik and the team at the Bach Center who own in their hearts every day this commitment to communication and education and clarity uh, that we all strive to accomplish in some form on this stage. Um, so I'm so grateful to be a member of this community. I'm so grateful for my colleagues from whom I continue to learn so much. And I'm really grateful to all of the people and the donors and the faculty and the administration at Harvard who support this, I think, quite unique and important, both intellectually and politically 
weekly program uh, that helps us to communicate our work to each other and, and to others. So thank you so much to everyone. Wow, Stephanie, I hope that someday you would consider to be the president of Harvard. <laughs> now let me invite the A scholars to the stage, please. Now you all have been sitting here for quite a while. I'm not gonna deliver another speech, um, but I'm simply gonna say one thing. I'm gonna remind all the current scholars as well as the 20 other scholars, previous one, why don't you stand up as well? <laughs> I'm simply gonna remind them that you know one thing that anyone graduate from Harvard or anyone has Harvard affiliation, we all have this problem that we're always feared of being accused of through the H-bomb, but you all now can through the double H-bomb, the Harbor Horizons. Let's give them a round of applause, all of them. Now I'd like to invite everyone to the reception, and I will see you in 2019, and, but you will be here next year, and Dean Emma Dench will give you a great, great program. Thank you all.